there are few emotions more powerful than hope. It's a spark inside you that brings a smile to your lips, a light that shows on your face, a feeling that lifts your head and pulls you forward. These days, hope like that often feels hard to come by. Maybe you've experienced your share of disappointments, but real hope is what the Christian faith claims to offer. A joyful expectation for the future, based on true events in the past, which changes everything about my present. Hope Explored is a three session series for anyone who is looking for a hope worth having. Whatever you do or don't believe, this is your invitation to explore, to discuss, to question, to discover. This is Hope Explored. Good morning, welcome to our time together at St Mary's. It's a joy to be with you. Sorry we weren't able to publish our service last week. We had a confirmation and we weren't able to record the bishop. But let's uh, spend some time together today looking at God's word. We're gonna be looking at Psalm 121 because we're taking a break from John as we're doing the family service today. So let's pray together and then we'll study the book of Psalms together. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless our time together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to imagine yourself standing on the edge of the Judean desert, gazing up at the mountains. You're heading to Jerusalem for the great festival. And the joy of that is tempered by the threat of the journey that you've got to make. You've got to cross those mountains. And it's true for us today we have a journey, an intimidating journey, just as intimidating as those Judeans, Jews crossing the Judean desert. And uh, the, the hills might have been a hiding place. They might have been a place where you could hide, but they would also be a place where the dangers could hide. And that would give troubles and threats and concerns and anxieties. If you were going to make this journey, I'm sure you would make it sensibly you would take provisions with you, you take water, you may take a donkey with you, you may take food and you make sure you had appropriate clothing and footwear. Sensible things to do. So you wonder why the question, the question that comes to mind is why is he looking for help? It's the same as we have in our own age. We know where we're heading, but the journey to get there is a difficult one. The answer to the question where does my help come from? What sort of help is he looking for? He's hidden away in verse two, where we read he's looking for that help from the maker of heaven and earth. Matthew Henry in his commentary reminds us that no help that is sustaining can last, can come from anything else but from God who created heaven and earth. That's the core of this message today. Who do you trust? We trust lots of things in our modern age for our security as we make our journey. We trust our NCAP 5 rated cars, the money that we've stashed away for the rainy day, the CCTV cameras we put up around our house. There are so many things we put our trust in before we put our trust in God. Have we noticed, have you noticed how we trust everything before we trust God? When we're under pressure, we trust the things around us. Then we echo the, echo the psalmist cry elsewhere in the book of Psalms, Lord have mercy on me when those things fail us, when the money runs out and when things go horribly wrong. 
We only seem to lift up to our eyes to the hills when there's no other option. This psalm is a love letter. It's a love letter from God. It's a reminder that God is devoted to us. Verse 3 is a great verse. It reminds us that God keeps our footing steadfast. Imagine walking those hills of Judea. There's going to be a lot of loose ground. I don't know whether you've ever walked in uh, the Lake District or anywhere and walked on screed and shale. It's very disconcerting. It's very easy to lose your footing and slide down the hillside to the bottom, to put your foot in the wrong place. And we do that today. We put our foot in the wrong place. We do it metaphorically. We say the wrong thing and do the wrong thing. We forget to be kind, loving, courteous. We live for the moment. We make those crass comments that hurt people. But if we trusted God to guide us on our journey through life, we wouldn't make those stupid mistakes. And God doesn't desire for us to do that. He desires for us to live righteous and holy lives. He desires to keep our feet on solid ground. But then in verses three, four, five, we're given another wonderful picture. Now this reminded me of my parenting days. Uh, remember that image, that, that moment in life when the child is in bed and not well. It's the early hours of the morning, the child is sick, but you're not going to leave the child because you're utterly devoted to the child and sleep, well, that can come later, that doesn't matter. The primary concern is the welfare of your child. We have a loving God who's constantly watching over us, caring for us, concerned for our welfare. We could take these verses as practical verses, the concern for sunstroke and being moonstruck, but I think they are basically saying God is watching over us day and night, all the time. He is guarding us against the fears we have, both rational and irrational. He is watching over us. This is a really good message, a key message for the church to bring to the 21st century, because the biggest mental health crisis in the 21st century, and it is growing, is anxiety. Anxiety, in its truest form, is a mental and a physical state of a neg negative expectation. Mentally, it's characterised by increased arousal and apprehension, tortured into distress and worry, and it can have multiple physical uh, responses in the body. The, the issue is we're constantly worried about an unknown danger or threat, and we live in an age where that is a constant concern. We live with cognitive feelings of dread or anticipation of a bad outcome. And physical sensations we get like jitters, racing heart, they're, they're designed for a good purpose. They're designed to remind us that we need to be, pay attention to what's going on and we need to make necessary changes to make sure there's a good outcome. But occasionally, and in our age, bouts of anxiety are not natural and productive. They are not the price of being a human being. They are a constant pain in our hearts. What with climate change, the war in Ukraine, inflation, technology, and many other things, and 24 hour news, our society is becoming broken by the fear of the future. As we look to the hills, as we look to the journey we have to make, we're overcome by anxiety. And it's no different within the church. In the Diocese of Leicester, we have shaped by God. We have increasing financial difficulty, falling attendance numbers, increasing costs for our buildings. And the question is, when we're faced with all these anxieties, where do we look to? Do we look down or do we look up? While I was away on sabbatical, my studies took me through the book of Nehemiah. And he's a great help when it comes to this uh, issue. In chapters 1 and 2, starting chapter 1 verse 11, we read the following. And let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. And now I was a cupbearer to the king. 
In the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of the king of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had been, and I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, "Why is your face sad? See, you're not sick. See, you are not sick." This is nothing but sadness of heart then. I was very much afraid and I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and his gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favour in your sight, that you send me to Judah to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how long will you be gone, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, when I had given him a time. And yet I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given to the governors, me to the governors of the provinces beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he give, may give me timber, timber to make beams for the gates and the fortress of the temple and the walls of the city and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I'd asked for, for the good hand of God was upon me. Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river and gave the king the king's letters. Now the king had sent me officers of the army and horsemen, but when Sanballat and Honorite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of israel what we read here is an exile is the story of an exile living in a foreign land whose life and death it hangs at the whim of a king who could have him killed if he wanted to but he has on his heart to rebuild jerusalem where does Nehemiah put his trust when he's confronted with these issues? Did he put his trust in his own wisdom, in his relationship with the king? Does he put his trust anywhere else? No, he puts his trust in the Lord. Repeatedly, he prays to the Lord and seeks favour in the eyes of the Lord. And these words speak powerfully into the 21st century. They tell us that the God of heaven is watching over us. And we're reminded of them again in Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in the line Jesus Christ. Michael Wilcox, who wrote his commentary on the Psalms, put it like this. The believer is guarded as he goes to work and comes home from work in every context and in every situation. That is what this Psalm is telling us. We can make the journey because God is with us and watching over us day and night, morning and evening, at work and at home. So what should we take away from this? Should we take away a warm, fuzzy feeling that everything is fine in the garden? Or is there a practical application? Well, let's take, for instance, the issue of the church. The news is filled with the story that the church is in decline. We're not seeing young families come into church and things are generally quite dire. What is our response to this? Is it to panic, to cut clergy numbers, to close churches, to do the sensible thing, to water down the gospel, to fall in line with the world's teaching on family ethics, sexuality, and all the things that will make us more likeable so we might grow the numbers? I think the real response, the right response, is to lay hold of the promises and to look above the mountains to the God of heaven, the God who promised that the very gates of hell will not prevail against the church. We must follow Nehemiah and pray and seek God's face for his, his direction for the church. 
So a starting my point might be you actually go to the monthly prayer meetings that are held in the church. Now I'm not suggesting we should test God, but we should trust him. We should again and again in the Bible lay hold of the problem. Remember that again and again in the Bible, when people trust the Lord, he responds with loving care. And we should do the practical things that flow from trusting God. We should be giving at least a tithe, but as the New Testament tells us, gener from generous hearts. We should give of our time and our talents. We should really live in the reality that God is guarding us and guiding us in every moment of our lives, in the humdrum and in the enormous moments of our lives. Be honest with yourself today. Do you trust God for your security? Or are there other things that get in the way? What do you trust for your security on the journey through this world? The God of heaven who created heaven and earth and all things in that are in being or something else. You see, we can only know true peace when we face this world and its anxieties in the knowledge that God is watching over us. Billy Graham, a great Christian man, once wrote, at its best, anxiety distracts us from our relationship with God, with the God that is, and the truth that is, he is the Lord of heaven and earth. And that's the key thing I want to draw out as a conclusion to this. When we don't trust God, it affects our relationship. When you don't trust your husband or wife or your boss, you don't really enter into a full relationship with them. And therefore it damages your relationship with God. If your prayer life is rocky, anxiety will grow like a weed and your relationship with God will, will wilt. It will be like bindweed. Now I'm always pulling bindweed out of my garden, or Becky is, because she does a lot more of the gardening. And bindweed, if you've never noticed it, intertwines itself into the plant and takes over everything and eventually smothers the garden. It looks beautiful on the face of it because it has a beautiful white flower, but in reality, it chokes the life of the garden and, and, and hides the true beauty of the garden. That's what it happens when we don't look to the, to the Lord for our help. I want to close by quoting a hymn which seems to sum up what I'm trying to say today. O soul, you are weary and troubled. No light in the darkness you see. There's a light for a look at the Saviour and a life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and he will be all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. O soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's a light for a look at the Saviour and a life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. We're all on the journey. And the next Psalm, Psalm 122, is all about the joy of going to the house of the Lord. And we one day will be in the presence of the Lord we love, in the, in the presence of the God who saved us. But in the immediate, we have a journey to make. And the question is, where are we going to look to for our help and our sustenance and the power that can sustain us on that journey? Are we going to look to the things of this earth, the hills, where there are dangers, or are we going to look above them to the Lord who made heaven and earth, who will protect us and never sleep as he cares for us and watches over us? A practical step this week might be to write down your concerns. Write them out, literally, and be honest with yourself. Show your true anxieties on paper before the Lord, and then pray them. 
Pray them carefully and diligently to God and he will answer your prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're sorry that we don't trust you. That we trust the things of this world for our security. Lord, help us to trust you more and more. And Lord, we give to you now in the silence the things that make us anxious. Our health, our family, our money, our situations. Father, be with us now. In Jesus' name, take these things from us and give us peace. Amen. It would be lovely for you to be able to join us. I know that some of you can't get around to being at St Mary's at 11 o'clock, but I know that many of you could, and I would invite you to come and join with us as we celebrate and share God's word together. Amen.